Jake Sullivan, most wars, almost all wars, end in some kind of a negotiation. The sort of World War II war where one side completely annihilates the other is very, very rare in history. What will that, that end, what will those negotiations look like? The, the Chinese have put out this, uh, I don't know what they call it, a peace plan, it's, it's just out. It's a 12-point document detailing its position, calling for the end of hostilities and the resumption of peace talks. Is there anything to this? What is your reaction? Well, my first reaction to it is that it could stop at point one, which is respect the sovereignty of all nations. That's the first point in the 12-point plan. This war could end tomorrow if Russia stopped attacking Ukraine and withdrew its forces. Ukraine wasn't attacking Russia. NATO wasn't attacking Russia. The United States wasn't attacking Russia. This was a war of choice by Putin waged upon Ukraine, and it could end if he simply left Ukraine. And that is the best way for this war to end. Now, I cannot predict the future. What I can tell you is that the United States is not going to dictate to Ukraine how this war ends. President Biden tells President Zelensky and our allies at every opportunity nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. It is the Ukrainians who will decide how they proceed uh, towards the end to this war. Our job is to put them in the best possible position on the battlefield so they are in the best possible position to be able to do diplomacy whenever they choose to do diplomacy. And that is how we are going to proceed. But I think there's one more important point as we approach this anniversary, and as actually the anniversary has arrived in Ukraine. And that is Russia has already lost this war. Russia's aims in this war were to wipe Ukraine off the map, to take the capital and to eliminate Ukraine, to absorb it into Russia. They failed at doing that, and they are in no position to be able to do that as we go forward. And it is important for everyone to remember that the courage and bravery of the Ukrainian people has already accomplished that objective, and the support of the United States and our allies and partners around the world has helped contribute to that. But where this goes from here is something that will play out over the coming months. What we know is day by day, we simply have to keep doing our job, which is to give the Ukrainians the tools they need to defend themselves. Sam, whatever happens at the end of this war, Ukraine is going to need a massive amount of reconstruction and assistance. Do, does the world have the capacity? Does the United States have the capacity for the kind of thing? You know, people talk about a Marshall Plan like there was after 1945 to help Europe rebuild. Is that the kind of scale we need to be thinking about? Well, I think we associate the Marshall Plan with a moment. Right, just as we associate the end of the war, uh, World War II, uh, with a moment. Um, and it looks as though recovery and reconstruction in Ukraine, at least for the time being, is going to happen differently. Um, just uh, this month, earlier this month, the World Bank announced $50 million to invest in the repair and restoration of the transport networks, the transport infrastructure in Ukraine. And that's how USAID is proceeding as we try to catalyze the involvement of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the big international financial institutions, and to get the private sector to be interested in coming back to those parts of Ukraine that are relatively peaceful, um, and even you know, to continue to make investments elsewhere. We just uh, struck a, a public-private partnership with Bayer, which is building a new seed factory in Ukraine, which is going to employ thousands of Ukrainians. The more Ukrainians are employed, the more revenue there is, the less assistance will need to come from outside. So this is going to be from within and from without. But I think it's not necessarily going to be an on-off switch. It's something we want more Ukrainian refugees to be in a position to come home, to have infrastructure that awaits them, where they can live in buildings that have been repaired. Uh, but of course, the damage that some estimates is that the damage so far has been $130 billion if you take arable land, homes, hospitals, schools. So this is going to be a mammoth undertaking. The other thing we want to do now is with an eye to those big uh, ticket items, uh, which most of which will happen only when there is uh, a negotiated peace. Um, but we have to make sure that resources are going to be well spent. When you have those huge investments, which go well beyond what is being provided right now, that's when, of course, you want to make sure that you have the safeguards in place so that all outside investors and donors know that and can say to their citizens, that this is money that's going to be well spent. But I think President Biden has spoken uh, really eloquently, powerfully, to how much enthusiasm there will be when this war is officially over. Uh, the, the, you know, a number of actors are on the outside really wanting to be a part of the longer-term solution 
But getting the institutional frameworks right is something we can be working on right now in addition to these stopgap recovery efforts. Jake, I gotta ask you one final question. We've talked all about the world, Russia, Ukraine. We haven't talked about what's going on in the United States. Do you worry when you hear voices like Governor DeSantis, Senator Hawley, uh, Senator Vance, questioning why the United States is doing this, asking why we should be spending this money, uh, wondering whether we should be uh, taking a more neutral position. What I find so interesting about that perspective, we can't operate in the world because we have to operate at home, is it presents a fundamentally false choice that is not at all who America is. We can both invest at home and provide for the safety and well-being of the American people, and we can lead in the world. And that's what we have done at our best under Democratic and Republican presidents for decades. The United States is capable as a powerful, self-assured nation. We have the resources, we have the talents, we have the energies of our people to solve our own problems here. And President Biden has done more in two years to invest in this country, to build jobs, to provide for the social safety net, to deal with the problems that people sit around their kitchen tables and think about, while at the same time, mobilizing a coalition of free nations to support the values that Americans hold so dear. So what I would say to those senators is, yes, let's do these things at home, but are you saying that America is incapable of also helping to serve a powerful force for good in the world? I don't think that the American people believe that. I think the American people think we are capable of doing both, and at our best, that is exactly what we are, have done, and I believe that a lot of the moments I've seen in this last year in Ukraine, from those flags waving in small towns that Samantha was talking about, to the people in the US government who are trying to support uh, folks like Igor on the front lines, that has been America at its best. And so I think that there's a pessimism in this argument that these senators are making. President Biden has an optimistic view, which is we can do it, and we should do it, and we are doing it, and as a result, um, I believe that democracies in the world are getting stronger, not weaker, as the president said, and autocracies are getting weaker, not stronger. And that is better for every single person in this country.